on a place known for many things. It's the village once promoted as the Pearl of the Puget Sound. It's the town that oysters and water made famous. It's the capital city of Washington State. But more than anything else, Olympia is a place that people made great. So join us, won't you, in our Stories of Old Olympia. It's a tribute to our town's quiet heroes, the workers and the dreamers, the pioneers and the builders. They're all part of our story. They're all home folk. And while they don't always make headlines, they do make cities, and our city's a better place because of them. Welcome. I'm Joe Willing, your host for the story of Olympia. In this chapter, we're going to talk with a lively young lady who was born in Shawnee, Mich uh, Shawnee Wisconsin, excuse me, back in 1898. She came to Washington with her father, Dr. H.W. Partlow, when Governor Hayes sat in the governor's seat in 1908. She's been here ever since, uh, except for a stint in the University of Washington, where she studied bacteriology from 1917 to 1923. And as a soloist, as the first woman soloist of an airplane in the Olympia area. She flew back in 1936 and in 42 joined the Army WACS and served in the Army Air Corps, inspecting all over the country and flying all over the country to do so. Her father came here when doctors still visited patients at their houses with horses and buggies. We want to welcome Katie Dram to the story of Olympia. How are you doing? Just fine. Good. Quite exciting. <laughs> Katie, you know, we, we began this program, and although you don't see it here, with a clip of old Olympia downtown from 1914. Now, you predate that. You're, when you were 10 years old, you came here in 1908. What was the city like then? Well, when we came here in 1908, we moved into a, the Christian parsonage. The Christian church was on the corner of 8th and Franklin, mm -hmm. and the Christian parsonage had been built, and we were the first people to live in it. And my dad had a lease on it for a year or so. And so that when I went downtown, I went from there. Uh -huh. Next to, to our property was the property that adjoined joined our property, was a H.B. McElroy that went out to the corner of 9th and down to 7th, and then the park, you walk across 7th, what would be 7th through the park in downtown. Mm -hmm. And I remember- Is that park, is that Sylvester Park? That was Sylvester Park. Mm -hmm. See, we lived down there for a year or so. Mm -hmm. And another thing about that part of the country, or that part of Olympia, was that as I say, we went out to the corner of 9th and down and across to the park. But if you turned left, there was the famous Doan's Oyster House on that next block. All right. So we just went down, but it was down in the lower ground. You had to sort of walk down steps to get into it. Mm -hmm. And what I remember in that lower part of Olympia was the first thing was a, was a drug store. And it was uh, Ross's, Ross's Drug Store, because I came home and told my mother I'd been down to Huge Roses. It was Hugh Ross, <laughs> yeah, was right. a drug store. And then there was a department store next to it. I don't exactly remember the name of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a drug store down in the corner of where Hibberts and Coles used to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was Hill's Drug Store, and that was very famous. I mean, mm -hmm. later in my teen years down there, we used to, used to go in there to get our sodas and oh, things and everything. Soda Everybody soda would stop the there, yeah. And uh, I just don't, uh, there just didn't seem to be very many buildings. I remember 4th Street had uh, wooden blocks on it, was the paving, and... Uh, for the street itself? For the street. It was wood, wooden a wooden block, street. Wooden blocks. Hmm. And I remember uh, some of my entertaining was, uh, entertainment was sliding during the snow down uh, what is now, um, well, it was, would have been 5th. And they got in the Legion Way. Oh, in Legion, yeah. From oh, way yeah. up on the east, way yeah. up the yeah. top of the hill and down. Well, let's see, I can't remember too much about it. It wasn't a very... Oh, there was a Max Body's um, barber shop on mm -hmm. the left-hand side of Main Street. That street was Main Street. 
and the old uh, hotel, Mitchell Hotel, hmm. was on the corner of where the tunnel is now. Mm -hmm. And then going down farther, I'm just not very good about. Uh, well, oh, I Motlins was down Motlins, there on the corner. Right. Yes. I understand. On the other side of right. Uh, right. other side of Fourth, right. young ladies didn't right. go there. It was kind of. Yeah, that's the place that uh, the Chinese lived there too. Oh. oh. And that's the place that my father uh, brought a horse out from uh, Wisconsin, but of course he never used it. But he stabled his horses down there. There were mm -hmm. places where they stabled horses, although he never used it when he got here. Eventually, he had to get a car. Oh, that was yeah. that would have been on the other side of where the squire right. is there, huh? Right. Back in there. And then I remember the uh, old opera house, which was up Fourth uh, Street, and we used to have from the school. I went down to to a school at uh, St. Michael's Academy, mm -hmm. and it's where Mutual Savings is now. And we used to have a uh, go up there and practice for a big performance or something, a graduation uh -huh. or something uh -huh. like that. And they used to have home ta talent stuff in that theater. And we had some real good shows in there. Uh, the Spring Maid and the Student Prince and everything like mm -hmm. that. And my dad always used, and mother always used to take me, let me go to those at night. They were always on school nights. Uh -huh. But they'd uh, take me to them. And this was at the Opera House? That was at the Opera House. Now, that was quite a deal. Your school was where Washington Mutual Savings is yes, now? Yes, right. But the Opera House was down, down the street further? No, the Opera House was on 4th, on the way up the hill. I'm trying to think of uh, oh. across from, uh, well, there's a, let's see, what is it? There's an automobile station across from there. Oh. I'll tell who was in there, that paint outfit, Lynch paint outfit. Oh, Lynch paint. That building was the old opera house. Well, that is. Right that. next to it. Oh, okay. Oh, where the Olympia Auto Parts was. And yeah. Was, I know the building. That's, that was the old opera house. And that turn, uh, that comes uh -huh. around, Johansson Ballet is in there. And there was a now. candy shop right at the entrance to the old opera house, yeah. right there in the corner. Good spot. Right. <laughs> I remember that part of it. Now, Olympia was a much smaller place back then. Oh, yes, but I don't remember the... Uh, I don't remember the population. I was just, I just wasn't interested in things like that. There that were a lot, there was a lot of, act well, you had the streetcar. Yeah, and the streetcar ran out to Tumwater, mm -hmm. and the streetcar went very, real close to, you know where the car line is, car line the di district is? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was real close to that, and there was a baseball uh, park out there. Oh. Because they could go okay. out by streetcar uh -huh. and get off, and there was a baseball park. We had a baseball team, and I used to go with my dad out there on Sundays uh -huh. to the baseball game, uh -huh, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But of course, we went in his little roadster. We didn't go by streetcar. We went in his, by that time, he had a car. Now, that, back then, there, there weren't traffic jams with, with automobiles. No, I should say not. <laughs> and the streetcar went as far as uh, Tumwater. Where in those days, we're talking about the, the main mode of transportation. Was it still a horse? No. no. Uh, Motorcycles, as I say, Dr. Ingham had a motorcycle, and there was a Dr. Mal with a motorcycle. Uh -huh. And uh, cars were beginning to come because we had our first car, I imagine, by about, it was a King. And that was when my dad and I were going out to play golf early in the morning. And that was about uh, 1912. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because almost immediately that we got here, he got a car. I see. You know, and uh, but were there many other cars at that time? No, not very many. And being a doctor's family, we had to have two, one for the family. So my brother, one brother that's seven years older than I, than I am, was very mechanical. And he worked in a, a garage after school called, that Blaine Esham ran, which is on, on uh, Fifth and Columbia, on the corner of Fifth and Columbia. And Blaine Esham also was Governor Hayes' chauffeur. He evidently kept a limousine there, and he would drive for Governor Hay. Because Governor Hay had a son that used to take me to, to matinees, and Blaine Esham would bring the car up to my house, and, and Bruce Hay would get out and bring, take me out and put me in the car. And All right. Blaine would take us to a, Sunday mat, a Saturday matinee. Now, that's the Something way to do like it. That. Was this a like moving that. picture? Right. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And what, what, there weren't, now this was, pre-talkie. This was silent movies? Silent movies, I, but I don't remember what the movies were. Uh -huh. And anyway, so 
we had we had a car by at least by 1912. Yeah. And then we had Hudson's. As I say, this brother of mine worked for that place, and uh -huh. he evidently got a credit by getting Hudson. So first, uh -huh. my dad got a Hudson 37, uh -huh. and then this picture that I have down here is a Hudson 54. Uh -huh. So those are the first cars. Hudson 54, yeah. Let's, yeah, that's a 54. Let's show our uh, our friends the uh, the Hudson here now. Are you in this picture? Yes. This little that that's me. Uh -huh. This is my sister, and there's a girl, little girl that's sitting on a stool. Her, mm -hmm. she was Ann Bay Allen, mm -hmm. and her husband, her father afterwards became one of our famous highway commissioners, uh -huh. James Jim Allen. Oh, I see. And uh, Amelia Stentz was another friend of mine. She was a friend of mine. She was the other one. And this was my sister driving the car. Uh -huh. And it was on the 4th of July, and we'd gone out to uh, Grand Mound, where those mounds were, and picked these, these daisies hmm. and decorated the car. And it was stopped there for the picture. Oh, I see. I thought maybe you and driven, it's on 4th Street. driven through a garden no. somewhere. <laughs> no, we went out and picked them the day before. Yeah, this is you here. Yeah, and that's me way down the corner. Oh, well, you've got a great smile. And I think I must have been about 14 years old. And this is what street? Do you remember what street this is? 4th Street. Oh, it's on 4th. Okay. They're right off 4th. Oh, I see. It's on Main Street. Oh, this is Main. This is Main. Which is now the capital. Going up toward the capital, mm -hmm. yeah, going this way. Mm -hmm. And 4th runs here. And fourth would be here, and third would be here. Mm -hmm. But third isn't called third anymore. It's Martin Way. Oh, I see. Yeah. And then here's the brick on uh, Main Street. Right. Isn't that great? That's a Hudson, eh? That's a Hudson 54. We first had a Hudson 37. And my, hus my father had a Hudson Roadster. A Hudson Roadster, Hudson 37, and then the 54. I bet he put a lot of miles on him being a doctor. Yes, and he did night work too, you know. And I used to go out with him if it was on a Friday or a, or a Saturday night when it wasn't a school day. My mother would let me go out and make with him at night. Mm -hmm. See, the rest of my family, there was I was the baby, seven years difference, and they were gone. Oh. So that was why I was with my father so much, you know, oh. because I was there alone. My brother was, doctor brother was studying medicine, and they were all gone. Well, I bet your I bet your dad your dad enjoyed that. Well, you know, evidently. I, I told you, I have, a, I have a, a Katie of my own, and she's just 11, and I just love it when <laughs> I can take her with me. And she goes out golfing with me now. Oh, that's good. Yeah, she takes her putter. Now, you played a lot of golf with your dad. Yeah, he started me. <laughs> you know, when, when we started playing out there, going out at 5 in the morning to play, uh, he gave, there was, I had one letter, one lesson I remember, but I can't remember the name of the man. We used to play, and he'd give me a stroke of hole. And that just went on almost morning, morning after morning after morning that first summer. Is that right? And I was about, uh, that was 1915, because I didn't have a membership, and you had to be 18, you see. Uh -huh. And I, he was teaching me to drive at the same time. To drive the Hudson? No, no, that was a king. Oh, the king. That was, that was before the Hudson. Oh, okay. That was a king. Uh -huh. These cards were in, were in uh, 1917 and 1918. Oh. And, well, the first Hudson Roadster that he had followed the King. Okay, so this, the Hudson came after the war, after the First World War? No, it came before that what because I used to drive out. I drove Conrad Hilton out to Fort Lewis. Oh, you want right? somebody famous. My brother-in-law was, uh, was out at Fort Lewis during training, mm -hmm. World War I, and so was Conrad Hilton. Mm -hmm. And they became famous or became uh, acquainted mm -hmm. and they used to come in on on Wednesdays they had a day off on Wednesdays play poker or something like that or go to parties and then I'd drive them out in my father's little Hudson out to before Reveille the, out the to next Camp day Lewis. Yeah, out of Camp Lewis the next day and uh, Conrad was exactly 10 years older than than uh, I was and uh, he was a millionaire at that uh, time oh, money back and back. also he was a member of the of the legislature of um, New Mexico hmm. he was quite famous everybody was all the junior leaguers in Tacoma were rushing him and so on and so forth and he'd take me to the dances the uh -huh. legislative dances and so on and so forth I think he just did it to 
you know, keep from being rushed by uh -huh. the girls. I don't know. But anyway, uh, he did it no, we had it. the Hudson's before that. Uh -huh. You had the cars before that because there was a lot of them. Um, I was driving all the time, hmm. you know, because, uh, as I say, there was nobody else in the family to drive. Yeah. So and you... from the time my dad taught me how to drive, I even ran over a man in Olympia. You ran over a man? Yeah. Oh, did he? <laughs> how did that? <laughs> how well, did he feel after that? This uh, Hills Hills Drug Store, which I told told uh -huh. you, I was going up the street. It was in the evening, early evening, and there was it was snowing, and these cars were right hand cars, uh -huh. you know, and I was looking at. Well, they didn't have windshield stripes. You had to hand, you had to work that windshield by yourself. Oh really? Yeah, yeah you know, you had to do it forth. yourself. And I was sticking my head out this way uh -huh. when I t was took off and started up the street, up Capitol Way, Main Street to home. And I was looking out the window this way because snow was all over my windshield. And there was a porter, a man that worked in a barber shop, Max Body's barber shop. Evidently, I hit him with this tire, mm -hmm. right hand tire, and ran over him. He had walked across the street, but he had pulled his coat up like this. Oh. I didn't see him, and he didn't see me, and it wasn't a crosswalk. It was the middle of the street. Uh -huh. So anyway, they took him to the hospital, and there was, and my dad went over him, and there was nothing wrong with him. But my doctor, but my brother was seven years old, just raised cane when I got <laughs> home. You shouldn't be allowed to drive anyway, he said, or something like that. <laughs> well, you know, he shouldn't have been yeah. walking in the middle of the street either. Yeah, so he? we had those husbands, I'd say, from, from oh, maybe 19... Thirteen or so, we hmm. started with cars. Yeah. Now your dad was, how many doctors were in town when your dad came here? Dr. Ingham and Dr. Mao that I remember. Uh -huh. And then there was a Dr. and Mrs. Flora Mustard, hmm. that she was the cham belonged to the Chambers family, the, which is quite a famous family in this county. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, that's just about all that, oh, Dr. Redpath. And Dr. Redpath did all the surgery. He was the only surgeon. And then you see my dad, before he moved out here, went to Chicago. He moved all of us to Wisconsin for a year while he went to Chicago and took a postgraduate course and he took surgery. So when he came to Olympia, he started in on surgery. Uh -huh. And the reason that he almost had a nervous breakdown, he was so overworked, is that all the surgery was between my doctor father and Dr. Redpath. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other doctors didn't seem to, I don't remember whether Dr. Ingham did any surgery or not, but I'm sure that Dr. Mao didn't. Mm -hmm. And later on, there were other you know, surgeons that came in. Mm -hmm. But at that time, and then besides doing surgery and night work and country going out in the country and all this work, it was a little bit hard on him, yeah, you know? Yeah. And that's why he built this tennis court now your dad built a tennis court? He had the tennis court built thinking that maybe he, sh he could play tennis to get some exercise uh -huh. in between his work, mm -hmm. right off the side of our house. Uh -huh. What was the house then? Levinson and Columbia, oh, the Levin house that he had built after we moved out of Christian Parsonage. Mm -hmm. And it was a regular grass court, and it had um, was built just like a great big sides to it all the way around, you know, covering except the side that was next to the house because it broke off, the lawn broke off there. Mm -hmm. And my mother had planted rambler roses on the outside of it. And guess what? A man by the name of Pogie Wilder, who's a neighbor of mine now, used to come over. He lived down on, on uh, oh, one of the side, Franklin. He lived down on Franklin. And he was just a little tot. He used to come over and peek through the fence and watch me play tennis. <laughs> right? And he just lives down past me now and has been for years and years and years. <laughs> And you must have been pretty good at tennis. I was. I was uh, the only, uh, we had the only tennis court in town. Yeah, that helps. And then a lot of us, some of my sister's bows, you know, she was eight years older than I was. Uh -huh. But one, of, one boy was John Pierce, who he and his brother Thad Pierce ran the Olympian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had played tennis evidently in college or something. So he used to make an appointment with me. He'd play at six o'clock in the morning if I'd, you know, let him. Hmm. So I'd get up and play with the, with the big boys too. Good for you. You know, yeah. as well as the little ones. So I did. I got to be pretty good. Pretty nice life, huh? You had tennis, and you had the governor's uh, car to take yeah. on Saturday to the matinees, yeah. and then golf. 
Now, <laughs> another thing we did there, the old, uh, the uh, frame of the, uh, the basement part of the Capitol mm -hmm. was built. It right. was this great big concrete thing up there. Right. And then they, they didn't, they lost they didn't, it. Didn't and they left it there. It, right. And we used to go up and play on that, you know, because the, the oh. youngsters from it down. Is that right? Just, uh, yeah, just on, the, on the foundation? Yeah, on the foundation. Uh -huh. We used to play on that. Did it fill up with water in there? Or? I don't remember any water. Right. I just remember it sort of running around on the top yeah, that, of the... That you know, made it great. Yeah, it great. Then, then Wilder came out to do the plan and, yeah. and fix it again uh, when it finally was built, right? Yeah. And you knew him too, didn't you? He was out, he was playing golf. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I remember him real, real well. I remember him riding around Olympia in a, in a roadster with a gal, Elma Martin, who was Pokey Wilder's older sister. Oh. And he evidently took her out a lot when he was, when he was here. Uh -huh. I remember that very well. And I remember, I'm sure that I played with him several times out there mm -hmm. because he'd be out there in the evening. Mm -hmm. He was quite a golfer. I see. He you played know. a lot with your dad and with uh, you and uh, Well, Jesse we'd always Mills. pick up, you know, somebody. Uh -huh. My dad and I'd go out. Oh, I see. My mother would have an early dinner, and we'd go out and play. And just the two of us, you know, just like you do at the golf course mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Jess Mills, who was mayor of Olympia, was one of them mm -hmm. that uh, we used to play with. And uh, I'm sure that I played with uh, with Wilder, uh -huh. too, because he was always out there in the evening. Okay, now... Was that at the uh, the country club over in Cooper Point, or was that in Lacey? That was out at Lacey. That was the very beginning of the country club. Mm -hmm. And when we used to go out at 5 in the morning, we would park our car. The first tee was just off the, the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And there was a great big maple tree hanging over it. And we used to park right off that tee. And we'd play. And I'll never forget those mornings because the meadowlarks and you hear this, you know, the early morning, still morning with the meadow larks. Yeah. And it was all prairie land around out there. No houses, not built up like it is now. Maybe there were shacks. And the big mountain, you know, behind yeah. you. Yeah. The most beautiful mornings. Yeah. And then I'd take the car and drive back to the top of East 4th Street Hill. And then he'd go on home. And he taught me to drive oh. that way. Oh, I see. But he'd take the, the wheel from there on in? Yeah, from there on in. I see. And that was... Uh, well, the country club was out there about eight years, I guess, in Lacey, wasn't it? And we went down to the country club. I remember that very well. My brother and Dr. Kenneth Partlow and my husband and Bill Yeager, who was an engineer, and uh, another man, Earl McCroskey, who was a banker, and another man bought that property from Butler, the Butler estate. They made the arrangements. Oh, I see. And then they broke it up into lots. You know, and did the people, land development. People did. Mm -hmm. People drew, drew for lots. I see. see started, yeah, I remember that was about 1924. That, that runs from Tycho Cove all the way over to Butler Cove. I guess the land there. No, no. That they developed. It, well, maybe they sold uh, during the sometime during the depression, or I don't remember what happened. But down across, as you go toward Cooper's Point from the clubhouse. Uh -huh. They sold land that they had up there. Originally, they had they went farther down through there, oh, I see. but they sold that way way back in history. Uh -huh. So the part that is now is what they had. I see. And then you were there when they built the clubhouse. Uh, I was there when we built the clubhouse and very active because we gave parties and things to raise money to raise, to buy a piano and so on and so forth. But before that, in my real young youth, when I first was in Olympia. We used to go down there by a, a, a boat called the Lester D. Uh -huh. It was a launch. Uh -huh. And he used to, people at that time had camps all along the shore. Uh -huh. And they'd, the camps were made, to, a tent camp, oh. you know, right on the edge of the shore with canvas on top. And they used to go down and spend the summer. And the Esther, Lester D would take them down and take, make runs to the country club because there was a dock there uh -huh. and it was called country club. It was called the country club yeah, before right, it was right. the country club. Yeah, and there was a little old house, wooden house without any doors and windows in it there. <laughs> and there was a dance place up at the open dance pavilion up at the head of the cove. Oh, really? Yeah. Where would that be now? In, by the well, clubhouse there? Or? No, in about where my nephew lives, Dr. Kenneth Potlow. He's up at the end of the... Cove. Oh, it's oh. almost up at the end of the cove. Because oh, they used to put logs in there. 
You know, they had logs working around in there. And they had dances there on the weekend? Once a month in the summertime, they'd have a dance. I see. But of course, it was, it was an older crowd than I was. I wasn't old enough to go. But the young ones, the, my age, used to go down on the Lester D in the morning and take our lunch mm -hmm. and stay all day and swim. That's where I learned how to swim, was down there in front of the country club. Oh. And then uh, go back by uh, the last one of the Lester D, the mm -hmm. last run of the Lester D, maybe it was 9 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. But the Lester D made the run of both bays and took care of all of the campers that were down camping on the beach. Mm. And several times my father used the Lester D to go out and make a call on the, oh. um, to go up towards Shelton, oh. you know, to make a call by water that sure. couldn't get to in any other way. Yeah. That was quite a boat in that time. Well, there were a lot of those, those boats, they called the Mosquito Fleet that used to dock at Percival Landing oh, there? This had nothing, this no. was a small, this was, small this was a launch. But you would take, we called it a launch, I it see. had seats and you know, just one row of seat uh -huh. on both sides. Uh -huh. And then he had a railing so that you, you could, uh, in the back, mm -hmm. in a sort of a cockpit, you could sit out there with the railing. But it wasn't large, it was I a see. launch. And then this was, you caught it over at Percival Landing there? No, it no? was at, um, yes. Yeah, there was a boathouse in there, uh -huh. but I don't remember where the Lester D was kept. It was kept in there someplace. I see. But the boathouse is where we got the canoes. We used to get the canoes and go canoeing oh. in the early evenings. Now, where was was that the canoes? They were over here at Percival Landing. Yeah. Oh, okay. There was a boathouse in there. Oh, that'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? Yeah, right at the head of the head of the thing, mm -hmm. and we'd get that get in that. Uh, uh, get a canoe. Our boyfriend would get the canoe, uh -huh. and that was and ask us to go canoeing. So we'd go out and canoe around the bay, uh -huh. you know, for yeah. an hour or so. I don't know how much they charged, but they charged so much for. That was the way that we were entertained. We were oh, recorded, in other words. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. In a more genteel manner right. than today, I, I I think. Right. I'll be done. And then people used this old wooden house at the that didn't have any doors or any windows. My sister and a couple of uh, other girls, the three or four other girls, rented it for two weeks, I remember, one summer, and went down. And I have pictures of them sitting in hammocks, oh. you know, and playing. People used to use it. That's the only thing I remember. That yeah, was the was only that? building on the place. Uh -huh. Over by the country club? Right. And the only way you could get in there then was down toward the head of the cove. It was a road that came from up above, and it was just steep. It just went right straight up, Ooh. and it was all uh, gravel. It was a terrible road. Nobody ever used it, but my husband's mother had a simplex, which was an English car, hmm. and a chauffeur. Hmm. She was quite a moneyed little old lady, and this chauffeur took that car down that hill one day. I remember that, that simplex, evidently to show off. Mm -hmm. You know, but he made it, he made it down, he made it up, but there was no road, uh, huh. no road like the, where the road is now. It just went straight up to the, whoa. And nobody a, went down there, they had to no. go by water, you see. No. Everybody went by water in those days. It's hard enough to walk up and yeah. down there. Yeah. That must have been quite something. Now, when, when you came here, there was, there was a hospital already. That's right. Yes, right? the old hospital was there. And uh, the tramps used to come up from the railroad. Uh -huh. and go to the hospital for a handout. Oh, is that and right? they'd come up Columbia Street, you see. Uh -huh. And that's where we were living. We were on Columbia. And then also several people in Olympia had Chinamen. Mm -hmm. The people that lived across the road from us, the man was named, the family was named Graves. Mm -hmm. And they had a Chinaman. And then A.C. Baker, who was the famous clerk of, of the court for mm -hmm. years in Olympia. Yeah. Frank lived Baker's up, father. Frank Baker's father mm -hmm. lived up, uh, he had a Chinaman. Mm -hmm. And they used to come up together, and one would stop at across the road, and then the other would go on up to Baker's. Mm -hmm. The Chinaman would come up oh. through that. And I remember this hospital, this old hospital, because on, my, on the side facing that I could see, on the side from our house, was evidently a fire escape. Mm. And my mother was in the hospital. The women were on the third floor. They didn't do, take babies. They didn't have um, babies there at all. They had the babies at home, I guess. Yes, they didn't have any, they didn't, wouldn't take babies in the hospital. Hmm. But she was there for an operation. I used to go up that ladder 
at meal time, dinner time, so I could get her dessert. <laughs> I remember that real well. You'd sneak that out. And, and then they yeah. built the hospital on the west side. On the west side. Yeah. And I had my first child in the hospital on the west side. That must have been quite an undertaking yeah. to, to build that hospital. You mean the hospital? Uh, the, the one the on the one? west side, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't seem to be. It seemed to go up quite fast. Yeah. It was the Sisters of Providence? Or same sisters. Same sisters. Same sisters. Had that, and then they built St. Pete's right. out uh, in Lacey. Right. Huh. And my doctor brother was very prominent in that building mm -hmm. and was doing a lot of surgery at that time. Oh. At now, let's see, that was your, your brother, Kenneth, and then he had a son, Kenneth, Kenneth who was a doctor, and then he had a son, Who's Kenneth a, the third, I guess. Yeah, who was an orthopedic surgeon. Who's, uh, They're all doctors, but the second one, my brother's son, was a pathologist. Uh huh. I see. And, and the third is is a is a orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Four generations of right. Doctor Parker. And I call him the young doctor, and they laugh. When <laughs> his office just laughed like everything when I called and said, "I want to talk to the young doctor." <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're also a businesswoman. You have a you have a thriving holly farm. This holly thing. What happened about the holly? My husband was vice president in what was the Olympia National Bank. Mm -hmm. He was in in there for insurance, vice president for insurance. The bank closed, mm -hmm. and like a lot of young people who had small children, we went to the country, mm -hmm. and we bought this 20 acres. 20 plus acres down on the Cooper's Point Road. Uh -huh. And because I, we had two small children, and you know you can, you can plant potatoes. Our idea was at least you can feed them by planting <laughs> oh, potatoes when you go to the country. Uh -huh. And so uh, at Christmas time, uh, we went down there in July. Now my mother's house, or where, my, where I grew up with, on 11th and Columbia, my mother had a green holly tree with berries, uh -huh. a huge, great big one and a silver holly tree with berries. Mm -hmm. So this place that we bought was all in fruit. Mm. Where it's holly, it okay, was fruit. Let's, let's show our friends this. That was fruit. Every one of these little things was a, was a tree, a fruit tree. Mm. Pears and so on, and the whole place was in fruit, which is an entirely different story, which I can't go into it because it's too long. But it was all of the, eventually all of the, Upper part of Cooper Point. I see. Now this is towards the uh, end of Cooper Point. Right. This is on El. This is Eld Inlet. Right. Oh, I see. Okay. See, and the property right. slopes down toward Eld Inlet. Uh huh. So my mother at Christmas time said that year, "Why don't you go into the holly business, Catherine?" Because of the trees that she had. Because you, you had, see, you we had, had the farm. And we didn't have any business. Mm -hmm. Our bank had closed. Oh. Of course, my husband had moved across the street. The Nealon building, which was on the corner, belonged to his mother. Mm -hmm. She was a Nealon from Shelton, and he had opened an office there. But mm -hmm. we just didn't have any money, you see, in, in those days. Mm -hmm. So uh, that first Christmas, I was sent to a man over at Gig Harbor who made uh, holly, who was in the holly business, and they made wreaths and ordered a wreath, and I got the uh, wreath, and I cut holly from her house. My husband got the orders, and I shipped those reeds the first year. That was the first year in the holly business. Mm. Now it's my 55th year, mm. and I'm doing just a very, very little what I call a retired business. Uh -huh. But I grew that business up into a great big business. I'm writing my autobiography, and 1951 was my biggest year, and I did almost $15,000 worth of business when I sold my reeds for three and a half, three shipped. Nine. Shipped. Is that right? Yeah, and they're great big, that's great a lot of big reeds. reeds. So anyway, that started. My husband took over the uh, the business part of it. He built a, a little holly house on the road coming in, where we could store the holly and where we, the reese makers could make so on and so forth. He got the plate Holly Hills Plantation. We named the place Holly Hills Plantation, mm -hmm. and did all the business part that you would do. You know, got the equipment and everything like uh -huh. that. And then we were divorced in 1939. So from that time on, the court gave the business to me. And uh -huh. so from that time on, I took over. Oh, I but up to that time, up to 1939, well, he handled the, mm -hmm. the business the part, business of, part of, and yeah. I did the production in. So Got the wreath makers and everything like that. That's a lot of wreaths. Yeah. 
You must have had 5,000 wreaths uh, in 51 that you sold. No, they were, they weighed four pounds shipped. I see. They were a big, they were made on a 10 inch ring, but there were six inches of holly on each end, on mm -hmm. each side. Mm -hmm. So it made them 18 inches overall. Oh, I see. And they weighed shipped four, four pounds. Mm. And then the berries were put in afterwards. You see, the berries were not, not put, not made, or put in when the uh, holly is, uh, when the wreath is made. It's made in clumps mm. and wired to the wreath. Go all the way around, and then you, you plant, get all the leaves off the berries and plant them. Mm. Is that still pretty good business? I mean, it, it evidently, I've had <coughs> several calls. Although I don't take new business and I don't do, I'm just doing enough. We're under what's called open space. Right. And okay. open space, you have to, For you don't, purposes. you have to sort of keep a little bit, you right, know, going. Right, right. So uh, that's uh, what I'm doing now, just a little bit of holly because it's cold for me, oh, yeah. you know, to get out there in the cold. Yeah. Although I have a lot of help. My daughter, Vicki, does an awful lot. And then I have a little, or have a Cambodian that works for me and mm -hmm. he, on Saturdays, he stays, works and during holly season for me, so it's not too bad. Huh. When, you met your husband here in Olympia? He was a childhood sweetheart. The Drams came from Shelton to begin with and uh, moved to Olympia maybe in about, well, about 1911 or 12, just about the time we came here. Oh. And uh, so he was, I just grew up with him, oh. you know, Walter H. Dram. And he had an insurance outfit here. Oh, insurance. Yeah. Okay. Water H. Dram insurance. So we fought during my teenage years, you know. <laughs> I remember once he had taken me to a show and coming home, why he pulled the ribbon on my hat or something and I hauled off and hit him. I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I remember that just like everybody else. And so I knew him uh, for a we were on and off, and then he'd have another girl or something like that, and mm -hmm. I'd have another boy, you know, yeah. all that during oh, sure. teenage years. Sure. Yeah. When, then you went to uh, University of Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. What was that like back then? I mean, it's... Well, I was there during the, uh, the, uh, well, the, when the troops were overseas. Mm -hmm. You see, I told you about uh, Conrad Hilton. Right. All right, uh, they had gone overseas and I went to the university. That was my first year. And we had uh, naval aviators on the place and we used to have uh, tea dances for them. And there was lots of things going on, but that fall we had that big flu epidemic. All right, yeah, yes. Great big flu yeah. epidemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the university was closed and I came home and helped my dad in his office. I remember uh, he was worked to death during that, too, you know, you know, all the other young doctors. My doctor brother was gone, and all the young doctors were gone. So I came home during that. Then I remember after going back over there, I was corresponding with Conrad Hilton, and uh, he wrote me finally while I was in college that he was going to marry a junior leaguer down in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. to let me off the hook gently or something. I don't know, just really about it. But anyway, um, we had lots of dances, and I was a good dancer, and I was very popular, and I had lots of fun, but I didn't work very hard. <laughs> we had house parties like they did. I was a Delta Gamma, I joined a, uh -huh. a sorority. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, just the regular things you do, go to the football mm -hmm. games, and if we were playing down at... Uh, Portland, if Oregon and Washington were playing, well, maybe a gang would go down and follow the team mm -hmm. down to mm -hmm. Oregon. And I never went to California, but I remember going to Portland several times to the gang. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my first um, rides in a plane was uh, going down from, from uh, Seattle in a plane to a football game, a, a party of, of us from Seattle and Olympia. And nobody wanted to go in the in the plane except this one man. And I said, well, I'll go with you. So the two of us went by plane and the rest went by train. And we got came into uh, Swan Island in Portland, or off Portland. And it was dark and they didn't have any landing lights and they had oh to put lights, put lights all along the field when we landed. 
And that was quite exciting because it was one of my first trips in a plane. Okay. Not the first, but it was one of my first ones. And it was bumpy, you know, going over the, the uh, mm -hmm. river. Mm -hmm. It was bumpy. A lot of air currents yeah. there, huh? What year was that? Well, that I can't remember, but it must have been... Must have been it was after, uh, was after I was married. Okay, so yeah. it was in the 30s, yeah. sometime right. in the 30s. In the 20s, in the high 20s. In I the high 20s? Yeah. Well, that was, right. uh, aviation was really in its infancy. Right. When was the airport opened here? Well, 19, my, I sold in May of 1936. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, Governor Martin had bought the first plane for the state of Washington. And he put Lacey Murrow in as his highway commissioner and gave that plane to Lacey Murrow to run. And Lacey Murrow hired a man by the name of Jack Cram. He turned out to be he, a general during this last war. Jack Cram was the first teacher out there. And they just built a, they, uh, the plane to begin with, the plane that uh, I'm talking about, was kept at first over at Gray Field because we didn't have any place in Olympia to keep it, uh -huh. you see, the one that belonged to the state. And so they, when Jack Cram came, now you see, I said 36, so it had to be, you know, just before that, right. sometime in the early 30s. Well, after we moved down the bay in 34, it had to be between 34 and 36. Mm -hmm. And so they built just these little wooden shacks sort of to begin with. And Jack Graham was teaching. He was the first teacher. Oh. And so, as I say, I, there was a lot of, there was a lot of sort of skullduggery. I don't mean skullduggery, but uh, Dewey Martin was flying. Jack Graham had taught Dewey Martin to fly in the, in the governor's, in the big plane, the state plane. It was a steerman. Uh -huh. It was a steerman. And so we were very excited and we became acquainted with the, uh, Jack Cram and the people out there. Mm -hmm. Mary Martin was quite interested in Jack Cram, and so was I, and Marge Merle was too. We were all about the same age. So I think the reason I started to fly was more or less to, to get a, in on them or something by going. So anyway, one Sunday I was out there with everybody, and I said, well, I want to fly. So I took my first flying lesson, uh -huh. and he taught me to fly. Isn't that, did, did it scare you a bit when you soloed, or? No, I could go on with that, but I don't think you want to hear my story. Uh, the rest of my story on that. On the flying? Oh, sure, let's hear it. Okay, after I soloed, I soloed in, at night. My husband soloed in the morning, and I soloed at night. Uh -huh. And then I flew around the field and, and so on and so forth. Then I was flying, I don't, know, don't remember now how many solo hours I had, then one day, Governor Martin called me and asked me if I'd come up to the mansion to help him entertain Miss Seattle. So I did, I went to up the mansion, and of course I was a drinking to beat the band. Most of us in that age did were pretty, pretty high on liquor a great deal of the time. And I had a lot to drink because I had just sold, and I was excited about that, you know, and talking over so Avia, Lacey Merle was there, and, and everybody and talking about flying. And so I called, I'm very impulsive. I called Jack Cram and said, I want to fly at seven in the morning. And he said, fine, I'll have the plane ready for you. So I went out there at seven in the morning and I got in the plane and I couldn't find the field. I went up and I just <laughs> could not find that field. I was hung over <laughs> from the <laughs> night before. So I went around the field until two or three times and I saw him standing there and I came down and I, just as I said, I couldn't find it, so I just pulled the stick right back and dropped it in. <laughs> and I ground looped the plane. <laughs> you ground looped the plane? Yeah, I ground looped the plane. And so then there was a party at the, <laughs> the Murrows that night, and all of these flyers he, that belonged to the Air National Guard was here then for, the, oh. for World War II. And uh, so they all kidded me and told me I, that it was just like riding a horseshoe. You just got up and started all over you again. Yeah, get back on, yeah. huh? and so you did. Right, so I did. So that was my error. And then when I went into the service, I went into the first WAC officer class. Huh? And when I got put in the, when they put the WAC into the Air Corps, 
Well, I, then I got into the Air Corps and I did a lot of, and flew with a lot of mm -hmm. uh, men officers making inspections of groups that were going to go overseas. Mm -hmm. I had the morale of the unit, uh -huh. you know, and the yeah. men would be in different branches of service and we'd mm -hmm. make what we call preparation overseas movements. Uh -huh. Like I saw my first Air, first B-29, we were inspecting uh, in Salina. We went into Salina and as we came in, I saw this great big tail way up over the hangar. You know, it was just huge. And that was a B-29. That was the first time I saw one. And that was big back big, then. Big. And while I was there, I want to tell you a story about that. I flew with a colonel whose name was Colonel Pete Brewster, mm -hmm. we called him, mm -hmm. and most all of the, he was head of this inspection team that mm -hmm. I was at. We were at Wichita, and he was going to be um, checked out in a B-29. He said, you want to go up, Katie? And I said, I sure do. So they put me in the nose of the plane, up there where all the instruments are, and you can yeah. just see for everything, you know, just yeah, see everything. it's all glass there, right? Of a B-29, we yeah. got up and we're flying around, we lost an engine. You know what that means, I mean, an engine just quit. It right. doesn't mean it right. dropped So We lost an engine, so when we got down, uh, he said, uh, well, you're just a jinx, you're just kidding me, you know, that's the reason we <laughs> lost the engine. But I had lots of interesting flights in the, in, oh, in the air. I got over a, they told me at the field where, the, where you uh, sign up every time you go out, they keep track of how many hours of the planes and how many hours of the passengers. Mm -hmm. They told me one day when I came in, he said, you know, Captain Graham, you've had 1,000 flying hours. Hmm. That's a lot of hours yeah. in the air. Right. That huh. was a very interesting... Uh, what year did you get out? I got out in the fall of right after uh, 1945, right after Japan. Oh. Surrendered. I got sent to Spokane. I got myself sent to Spokane, uh -huh. ready to get out because I only went in for, uh, you know, patriotism. Right for the war. I was patriot. We were. I was working in Holly uh -huh. at during the time of uh, December, it was sort of the end of the season uh -huh. when uh, Japan hit, and uh, I went right on the filter board. We had, Olympia had set up a filter board. Mm -hmm. And I went right on the filter board just as soon as I got through with holly season. Mm -hmm. And I worked on a night filter board. Mm -hmm. And one day, one night, the Army used to feed us, used to bring us sandwiches or something in there for the night supervisors. Mm -hmm. And one day, the, a Judy Pride, her father was the uh, highway patrol chief here, had evidently was the volunteer, the civilian volunteer that had to do with the uh, filter board. Mm -hmm. And I heard her say something about that they were going to take women in the service and that she was going to go. Mm -hmm. So that night, as soon as the thing was over, I picked up another girl and I drove to Seattle to the federal building and I did let her out. She got in front of it and I went around the back to park my car and we were the first people there to, to to uh, put in our application for the whack whack. <laughs> and she got a picture in the paper because the photographers took her, but I was around parking my car. No, she you know? yeah. <laughs> just missed that one. So from that, I, then I went through all the deal to get into the service, uh -huh. you uh -huh. know. That so. must have been a rewarding time of your life to yeah. be able to help out back then. Right. Yeah. Hmm. What were the schools like back when you were, when you first came here? Compared to the well, when we came to, uh, and I went down to the academy. When, as I told you, we lived in in Madison for a year, mm -hmm. and Madison had uh, percentage, and it evidently was more advanced than the school in Shawano. Mm -hmm. And I was in the fourth grade at mm -hmm. Madison. In Madison, I had had uh, uh, fractions and was real good in fractions mm -hmm. in mathematics. And then when I got to, uh, to uh, Madison, I just didn't, it was more advanced than, the, than my school, than I was advanced. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I never do, I'm just beginning in my old age to do a percentage. I've always looked to put everything in fractions. Oh, really? So when we came to Olympia, I should have been in the fifth, but I was too advanced for the school in Olympia, so they moved me up to the sixth. Uh -huh. And so I just went right on up. And I don't remember too much about it. I remember uh, the ordinary classes. Uh -huh. 
things that I took. I remember histories and so on. I remember reading, reading. Uh, of course, now history was a lot easier for you because there wasn't so much of it. Well, I remember <laughs> the a, a, English history, particularly. Oh, really? Yeah, and ancient history. Uh -huh. And those histories, I loved history. Yeah. And very much that was very. Uh -huh. But I remember reading it on the way down, reading my lesson down the way down down to Providence to uh -huh. the school. You studying on your way down there. And also they taught music there, and uh -huh. I started taking piano lessons uh -huh. uh, immediately when I was there. Uh, at Providence. At that school, yeah. Uh -huh. Huh. Took, they How taught. big a school was it? Really it was a boarding school, you know. There was some. Uh, well, I can't tell you that either. I mm -hmm. can't tell you how large the classes were. Mm -hmm. The front part, the school was way back. If you notice on Columbia Street, there's rocks built up. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the back part of the building. Uh -huh. And then in front, going out on Capitol Way, was all open. And some trees in well, there, but lawn right. and everything. Right. And uh -huh. the school was, you know, sort of set back. Uh -huh. And we used to have recitals and so on, and we'd have people audience would be out in front in the lawn, uh -huh. in the lawn, and we'd have a platform or something from mm -hmm. the school. And that, but I can't remember how large the class is. I remember there was a boarding school, and I remember one girl that, uh, that was on this, uh, that stayed there. We just went to Seattle at that time, mm -hmm. always by boat, you know. Mm. There was no uh, rail transportation out of Olympia uh -huh. to Seattle. We'd go from from uh, Percival's dock, uh -huh. and uh, there was one gal there whose father was at McNeil's Island. He was head of, of the prison there, uh -huh. and she was a boarder. And several times that I'd been on the boat going to Seattle, going on the way to the Seattle, she would be on the boat and get off there. You know, and then I think there were some hmm. gals there that I knew that lived in Shelton and went to school hmm. there. But I don't remember the classes. But I went all the way through high school. Hmm. I finished high school there. At Providence. Right, at Providence. Did you board there when? No. No, you didn't. See, we just lived two blocks right. up the street. At eleven. So, yeah, at eleven. Uh, have, did you live there until you got married at eleventh, and then? Yeah. And then you moved uh, elsewhere and ended up at the Holly Farm. Yeah, when we were married, uh, when I was married, we began to have a house of our own. Mm -hmm. Where was that? Well, we built a little house up on the west side on, on um, Foot Street. But as you go up the hill, you go up the west side hill. Mm -hmm. You go up the west side hill this way, and you turn right. Mm -hmm. And that little street down there, we were across from what was the old Brenner home. Mm -hmm. And we built a little house way back off the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had a lot of lawn in front of it, and, and a lot of the lawn that went through the whole block. Our garage was way on the back part of it. And we lived there for until Mary, Vicky, this gal that was here, was born mm -hmm. in St. Peter's Hospital. And uh, then the next one was coming on the way. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Dram thought the the house was too small for two babies, so she traded houses with us. She and Mr. Dram traded houses. In other words, they sh she used it as a as a to sell or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't live in the, my little house. They just traded. So their house was over in the next block. But now as you come out on, on uh, Foot Street, it runs into Laurel on the other side of the hospital mm -hmm. up okay. there. Yeah. That next the block is Laurel. on the west side. Yeah. yeah. Well, we lived, their house was over in the corner of Laurel. Oh. And I would be over there. I know, remember real well that that's where, where we moved then. And, um, my doctor brother was telling me once the surgery of that hospital was on that side that he was up in the hospital operating and he saw my two youngsters, Vicky and Kit, going around the yard taking the tops off all of the yellow tulips I had <laughs> planted very <laughs> carefully the <laughs> fall before. You know, Christmas has changed a bit and they're trying to start it earlier and earlier every year. What was Christmas like? for you kids back in 1910 here in Olympia? Well, Christmas was the, uh, the things that I remember mostly about Christmas was the, the presents I got. I used to get uh, one Tom O'Leary, who was a cousin of my husband's, was courting my sister. And uh, he used to give me the little colonel books, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember uh, 
the things that I got was once I got a ukulele and oh I don't know I get things that got books I can't remember I just remember Christmas didn't seem to be what well, was the exciting time of the year you know and we always had a big dinner or so, so on and so forth my father liked to play cards Mm -hmm. And on holidays, there was always a lot of card play. That was from my earliest remembrance in Wisconsin. Oh. On holidays, they were always playing cards, not poker, I don't mean that, but yeah. whist or something like that, yeah. you know. That's mm -hmm. where I learned how to play bridge, was uh, by sitting uh, beside the table and watching people, yeah. watching the grown people play, mm -hmm. play cards. And I remember that part of it. Always on a holiday, there was card playing. And I made my, fr I used to make holly rays for the windows of the house from mm -hmm. those trees. Oh. I remember doing that at Christmas. And I remember my, we were not a drinking family, but uh, my father uh, always served a cocktail or something at, at Christmas and Thanksgiving, and I was always given one with, you know, with a mm -hmm. little sugar or something and mm -hmm. a little wine or something like that. I don't remember remember too much about that. Not quite as That's much. That's about all, and I, but I do remember that I seemed to get mostly books for Christmas, and sometimes uh -huh. I would get, not clothes particularly, but, huh. and I didn't seem to get toys. I'll say I remember getting a ukulele and I got a little older. A lot of nice memories, huh? Yeah. Well, That Katie, was a nice house, nice comfortable house. I want to thank you for sharing some of your memories with us today. Well, this has been fun. Well, it's sure been fun for me, and I'm yeah. glad that you could make it. And I'd like to thank you for joining me. I'm Joe Willing, your host for the story of Olympia. Thanks. This was fun. Okay.